Hello, and thanks for streaming The Near Futurist, a show presented by me, Guy Clapperton. This is a fortnightly look at technologies that are going to affect our lives in, you guessed it, the near future. And in this episode, we're returning to the security theme. And haven't we all been working hard at home? The thing is, home computing may not offer us the same level of security that we'd expect from corporate computing. And yet, we all use Office 365, Google, whatever they're calling it this week, I think it's Workplaces now, and the ubiquitous Zoom, which sounds like a cut price superhero to me, but that's just me being cynical. We use this stuff and just trust that it's safe. Well, my guest today isn't so certain. He's been looking into how cyber criminals are using legitimate Office 365 services to launch attacks on users and the enterprises they work for. He is Head of Security Analytics for Vectra and his name is Chris Morales. Chris, welcome. Glad to be here. Thank you. Great stuff. Chris, tell me first a bit about Vectra and what you do. Vectra is a uh, data science company, hence I focus on analytics, and we use machine learning to map out all the behaviors that occur inside organizations. And that means on the network, in cloud apps, wherever users are, wherever hosts are, wherever data is, we start to learn what that internal behaviors and movement looks like so that we can start to differentiate between what's considered normal, i.e. users just going about their day doing work versus what is malicious and what people should be concerned about the IE an advanced attacker going in and looking to steal data disrupt organizations or whatever they want to do. Isn't there a danger of false positives with that sort of thing? If someone starts behaving slightly unusually, maybe they've just got a new task to do or something. A hundred percent. Absolutely. And and that's where it gets interesting. and, And I think a differentiator in this field, if you were abstractly to just try to say, I'm just going to learn what's different, you end up in this weird issue where different is actually just somebody doing something new. For example, working at home, (laughs) work from home would have looked different and malicious. So in order to combat that, we've gotten very specific. And rather than just using data science, we actually start with security research. And we take all the attacks that have occurred in the real world, and we map those on a global data set to start to learn, well, what behaviors are actually used by attacks so that we start looking for very specific behaviors across the attack life cycle rather than just looking for what's different. And in that way, you get very specific and, and clear on what you're looking at and what you're seeing versus just, oh, this is new. The thing about Office 365 is that, and it was specifically Office 365 that I know concerns you, uh, or at mm-hmm. least in, in the first instance. IT overall has been under attack from hackers since I started as a journalist, and that was over 30 years ago. So could you tell me something about what exactly has changed? Yeah, I mean, you can trace phishing all the way back to the 90s to AOL Messenger when people would send emails looking to get people's credit cards, right? So it's, and then it's evolved into email, things like that. And that's been going on, yeah, since for quite a while. At the same time, office apps such as Microsoft Word and Excel have always had some type of vulnerability or they've been susceptible to somebody running something malicious in them to get onto a system. So yeah, all the components have been there. What's different now and more so maybe this year in particular with work from home is that Office 365 has gone from a way that people get onto systems or inside organizations, i.e. the initial infection, as in I'm going to get onto a system or get some credentials or maybe steal your credit card, which is actually pretty basic, to the point where Office 365 has become the network. And that's an interesting thing to grasp. What we've seen is that people have always done email attacks or, or word attacks, but now When somebody gets access to your office user identity, they have access to everything and they never need to get on an endpoint. They never need to be on a network. They don't need to be local. They can follow the entire attack lifecycle from getting on email all the way to getting to things like OneDrive. And we have to start thinking about what Office 365 is now. It's not just email, but also Word and Excel, but it's also Microsoft Teams. And on the back of all this is OneDrive. 
And companies, and Vectra included, by the way, have completely adopted Microsoft Office that we've seen the adoption rate of Teams. Microsoft just announced in their latest earnings this week, actually, 115 million daily active users versus it was only 75 million before this all started. And I've heard even 40 million at one point. They've been on a tear. Same with Zoom that you mentioned. All these tools really live in these tools. And that's where all the data is, everything that happens from this work from home exists in there. So all attacks are doing are just following the data and where people live. And I get that. No- I, I get that. But on the other hand, there have been home workers and even uh, companies have been online the whole time for decades. I'm just wondering why working from home is having such a marked effect. So here's an easy way to put it. Um, I, I can think in the last two days, I haven't actually logged into my company once, every, but I do log into Microsoft 360, Office 365 24 seven on every device I own. So the only place I actually access anything is in office. And I think that effect has become more rampant. And thinking more of lateral movement, here's another interesting thing. It used to be that when you're in an office space and everybody came to work into a building, you can get onto somebody's personal laptop or work laptop or device or something and then start to pivot between devices to get to a server or to somewhere else. You can't actually do that in an attack anymore. If you infect a laptop, a work machine or something, there's no other connected machines except maybe your Roku or your TV sitting at home. And there's no way from going from machine to machine anymore. So that office is actually the better way to go between user accounts and machines and activity than an actual physical laptop or server. On the other hand, uh, you, you're saying you uh, log on to Office 365, uh, so do I, but you should be using a virtual private network, a VPN to get into that, shouldn't you? Or just, you know, that's your uh, way into your office systems. Aren't we just both being very naughty and very careless by not taking those basic precautions? Actually, no. Um, so it depends on the application. So the actual value of, here's a v, VPN value. You don't want your internet provider to see where you're going on the internet. To me, that's about it. It it works as a proxy and obfuscates between like where you're going and what you see. However, apps like Microsoft Office and even Zoom as of this month have end-to-end encryption already in place. So they're already protecting the data. The only thing a VPN would get you is that somebody doesn't know you're using Office at your internet provider. But the reality is VPNs have to terminate somewhere so somebody can see the other end of it. Do you want to sound as confident as my interviewee in this episode? If you talk to the press or other media, are you worried you'll be misquoted or they'll just publish their story and not yours? Clapperton Media Associates can help with coaching. Drop me a note, guy at clapperton.co.uk and we'll arrange a time for an exploratory call. Now, back to the podcast. Okay, so are people kidding themselves that they're safe to an extent? I mean, they see something like they're on a VPN, they think that's that safety box tip, it ticked. Sort of, in fact, it gets worse. Uh, There's a cool trick where you can start a VPN company and have everybody tunnel their data to you. Now you can see everybody's data as the VPN provider. So that gets more complicated. It's good in theory. It works. It's just who you have to start asking yourself, well, where am I sending my data now? Who, who, who did I just sign up with and what are they doing and how are they managing it? I don't have figures to hand, but an educated guess suggests to me that there are more Wi-Fi connections than hardwired connections in the home. Is that something that affects the, the level of risk? I'm just trying to think of useful things that uh, our listeners can take away and it's action they can take right now. It absolutely does. And, and, you know, the problems, you know, to your stats, I look around, I have about 10 devices on my Wi-Fi right now, and I have one device physically plugged in. And it's because that's the only device I own with a physical network port. I don't have any devices with physical network ports anymore. So that option has gone away unless you buy adapters. What we've learned and experienced is that people's home Wi-Fi networks aren't set up as well as organization Wi-Fi networks that have entire IT and security teams doing the work. Because even in the office, I go into conference rooms, things like that, when I just go to work, like you're still in the Wi-Fi. It's just that it's a whole different level of Wi-Fi. It's managed differently. It's monitored, all these things. Getting onto people's home Wi-Fi is so easy. 
some of the passwords are so basic and, and just breaking in. So uh, yeah, somebody, because of Wi-Fi, somebody can just sit outside a house and just start to pull data and do all kinds of interesting things. And that becomes a real weak point as an entry point into companies and organizations on the whole home side. I suppose there's also the issue of uh, the education of the end user. We uh, perhaps are led to believe that technology is really easy to operate because it is. But like a souped up sports car that's run by a computer or something, that doesn't mean it's easy below the bonnet. I was at a conference a few weeks ago and the tech guy told the host that she would be better off with a hardwired connection. And I'll be perfectly honest with you, she didn't seem to know what he actually meant. It wasn't that she didn't have one. It wasn't that she couldn't locate the port or anything. She didn't understand what he meant by a hardwired connection because she just turns the computer on and it connects. So I'm wondering whether technology looking deceptively easy is actually exacerbating the problem. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a funny view. We have to accept that. Uh, I think hardwired connections are dated, to be honest. It's, it's like mm -hmm. having a keyboard on your phone. That That's not going to happen anymore either, but people debate it. They're gone. We have to live with wireless. That's the way the world works now. Um, well, thank everywhere. you for making me feel old. But uh, the the next question, I suppose, is uh, you've majored on Office 365, but we've mentioned a few other apps. Uh, are other commonly used apps at risk? So you, you always have the obvious, which so there's Zoom. Zoom's gotten better. Any kind of video conferencing, really. Web browsers have always been a thing. But interestingly enough, in the last couple of years, by the way, web browsers used to be the primary concern of attacks and targeted, but they're not anymore because the security and the controls in web browsers have actually gotten really good that even before the pandemic started, attacks started pivoting to things like Office 365 and targeting Microsoft Word and stuff more than web browsers because they have more vulnerabilities or easier to compromise. Um, okay, so... Let's get practical. Let's say we've got a listener who may be working from home and they're responsible for their own IT to that extent. What do they need to do about this? Does something need to happen at company level? Can the individual help themselves? Yeah, I honestly, the, the easiest thing, and this is so age old, that the, the number one thing is good authentication, good user authentication, which candidly, companies need to use multi-factor authentication. While it's not perfect, it is imperfect and there's ways around it, it's still the best thing you can do. In case secure. there are any uh, non-technical uh, listeners tuning in, could you perhaps explain multi-factor authentication? Sure. So I actually do this for all my accounts personally. So the idea that on top of your password, whenever you log into a system, it always asks for you to approve and say, was this you logging in into some other authenticator such as a Google Authenticator, Microsoft Authenticator, or even your mobile phone number where it sends a text and says, send me a code. The idea being that even if somebody compromised your password, you at least have a secondary device that you're getting to confirm like, yep, that was me trying to get into a system. I enable that everywhere I'm allowed to, both my mobile phones, my personal devices, my personal email accounts, my work, whatever it is, it, it does create a layer of complexity that's the simplest and number one thing you can still deal with. If data does go missing, and I know we're actually speaking on separate continents here, you're in the US, I'm in um, the mm -hmm. UK, uh, so the legislations may be different, but on the whole, if data does go missing, is it the company or the individual who tends to end up liable? Oh, that's interesting. I think it, it might be both actually. Uh, from a regulations perspective, like including GDPR, some of the, I'm in California, we have California's privacy regulations, as well as some others that are now enacted like GDPR. The company is liable for people's personal information. However, I guarantee if, if the company gets hit, that company is going to hold the user liable for any actions they have. Uh, and it might cost them their job, right? So mm. I think everybody loses Okay, and uh, final question really, uh, where can people find out more about yourself and your organization? Our website's vectra.ai, that's the easiest place to go. I personally uh, I drive a lot of our research around the data from all the different places we're deployed and all the monitoring, we're able to collect that data and share it out there. On our website, we regularly publish these reports for free with all kinds of interesting information on the kind of things attacks are doing.
that's all at Vectra.ai. Chris Morales, Head of Security for Vectra, thank you for joining me. Thanks a lot. And many thanks to you for listening. That was the Near Futurist podcast with me, Guy Clapperton. Don't forget to have a look at the website at nearfuturist.co.uk or my media training site at remotemediatraining.com. I'll be back as always in two weeks' time. Stay safe.